here in ERIA land. Um, good to see you today and appreciate you joining us for the ERIA conference in Nice, France. Uh, I'm on location in Nice with uh, some colleagues. I'll see if I can turn this. See if I don't know if I can or not. Is that the VGA cable? Oh, I'll go this way. I'll go this direction. See if I can show. Everybody wave, say hello to the people out there. So <laughs> there we go. So D David and Helmut and um, uh, Tim here with me today, and I'm I'm Josh Sipper, uh, uh, and uh, I'm I already gave one talk today that I recorded, so that will be out there. It's on uh, cyber and emergent technologies. So uh, we had a, some fun discussion about that. And look forward to some more on this paper, which is the cyber meta reality and microbiome. Uh, and so it's great to be here with you today. Uh, my name is uh, Josh Sipper. Uh, I'm a professor of cyber warfare studies uh, at the uh, Air Force Cyber College in Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. This is Montgomery, Alabama. And over here on my first trip to France and enjoying being with these gentlemen and discussing cyber things and other uh, computational and technical things as well. We've had a good discussion thus far. So thanks for being with us today. And let me go ahead and display my presentation and we will get underway. All right. So as I mentioned before, the uh, the presentation is named the cyber meta reality and cyber microbiome just taking a moment to display there we go and um this uh concept grew out of actually the cyber and emergent technologies paper that i presented earlier uh is it sort of uh well <laughs> emerged to to use the term uh just based off of what i began to see as not just the technological basis and theory uh, of of uh, of this new world that we're all living in this new reality that we seem to all be inhabiting as human beings and it's a strange dynamic because you know we as these human carbon-based life forms we're inhabiting so to speak a, another realm that's all silica based you know it's this uh with this these new types of uh, existence arising out of it as well so um i just started building a uh, meta theoretical concept off of that and um, pulled in several different pieces that I'll discuss here momentarily and um, just uh, glad I'm so uh, grateful that I can share this with all of you uh, here and, and abroad uh, as we move forward into uh, what I term the cyber meta reality and cyber microbiome. Uh, there's just a few things about me I won't uh, read it all. Uh, I did this once before with the other brief, so I don't want to bore these gentlemen, but I will say that I've been at the U uh, Air Force Cyber College for about a year and a half, and before that I was uh, still at Air University, uh, just in a different school, the uh, LeMay Center for Doctrine, Development, and Education, and I worked in the education branch of that, uh, doing quite a bit with uh, some, some of the cyber doctrine, but also uh, application development etc so some coding and things of that sort and then before that at the 26th network operations squadron the air force's uh, hub for all things cyber you could say uh, for the network for the operational level and did quite a bit of work there with uh, standardization and evaluation and before that i was with the uh with lockheed martin as an intelligence analyst and the, with the air force as an intelligence analyst before that so uh a little over 20 uh, about 21 years of experience in uh in the technical background and uh coming from intelligence and into into the cyber field um, but today uh what i want to do is just help in the exploration of what i have termed the cyber meta reality i uh, wanted to define it define a few of the pieces and parts of that um, look into what the cyber microbiome is as well uh, some of you may have read uh, about what a human microbiome is or the earth's microbiome planetary planetary microbiome 
uh, I'm applying the same concept to uh, the cyber meta reality uh, and, and the underlying pieces of that and the vastness of it. And also uh, a little bit about cyber threat intelligence within the cyber meta reality and cyber microbiome. So kind of drawing all of these pieces together uh, to kind of show how they all work together. Um, so let me begin with uh, defining the cyber meta reality. All right, so this, the way that I have defined this is the cyber meta reality is a reality of, of and about other realities. Um, you can think of it as your own individual reality. There is your professional reality, your family reality, your virtual reality, your spiritual reality, all of these different pieces of your life that come together that form your own individual basis of understanding of what reality is. You base your understanding of reality on your and your worldview on your collected experiences of your own collective meta reality. Species are understood in terms of their environment and the input that forms, changes, and allows them to proliferate. Humans are understood by their environments as well as any good anthropologist will tell you. So this is just a, a way of uh, looking at it from that perspective, a human perspective of what this cyber meta reality really is well so what now that we've kind of defined to some extent what the cyber meta reality is what is the cyber microbiome well the first and foremost we have to understand what a microbiome is the earth and indeed human beings share their chemical biological physicality with a host of enabling flora and fauna like the earth and bacteria fungi protozoa viruses other uh, minuscule things that live within us as humans. The human microbiome has most recently been estimated to outnumber human cells by several orders of magnitude. That's from Fierrier et al. in 2012. So our physical bodies are made up only of a very small percentage of actual human cells. We're we are all actually not, uh, we're mostly not human, I guess you could say, as far as our physical uh, existence is concerned and what we're made up of. Uh, so much more of us is non-human than is human from a physical standpoint. Well, cyberspace is the same way. Uh, most people only ever experience what's on the surface of cyberspace, but actually the cyber domain is comprised of vastly more information and spaces than we could ever fathom. Uh, first, you know, I want to look at several different pieces to this as I saw on the last on the last slide we're going to look at the dark web um, cyber viruses microorganisms parasites that, that kind of those kinds of things living archives um, there's so much archived information that exists out uh, in cyberspace that uh, just it's there you don't see it you don't even know it's there but it exists and how long will it exist well you know potentially from now on, never to be erased, just growing and building and becoming larger and larger and larger. Uh, and uh, something that I discuss uh, in, in another area, I actually wrote a book recently that I'm, I'm putting around to uh, some different publishers uh, about uh, junk DNA and cyber DNA and how that plays into the concept of uh, not just the microbiome, but because it's actually a part of the cyberspace, but um, sort of this one aspect that we don't consider very often about uh, cyber and how it's built. And that goes back to the concept of code that writes code. There actually is code that has been built that reproduces. It writes other code and per, uh, uh, perpetuates itself in that in that manner. So we'll go into some discussion about that as well. But if you look at the the visual concept on the right, it shows basically the whole the the old adage of the iceberg with you know the only a little bit of what we see is on the surface but then there's this vast uh, underworld or underlying uh, uh, reality underneath the surface of the deep web the dark web um, all of the things that I've already mentioned as far as uh, the cyber microorganisms and archived information and code so we'll get into those in some details we go through so here as we look a little bit more into the dark deep web there there there's one particular piece of the dark web slash deep web, as I put it, um, and th they are different. I won't 
go into too much of the differentiation between them right now, but we will probably get into that uh, some later. Um, but the dark market is a huge part of this. Now, uh, some of these uh, markets that I have listed here, like Silk Road and Trade Route, they have been uh, diminished uh, uh, through some uh, uh, police activities over the recent over recent years. But that doesn't mean that other markets, dark markets like them, don't still exist. In fact, they are proliferating. They're they're actually growing in the dark web. Uh, right now, uh, a recent study found that 57% of dark w of the dark web is occupied by illegal content like pornography, illicit finances, drug hubs, weapons trafficking, counterfeit currency, terrorist communication, and much more. And that's from Wyman 2016. So the idea is that th this huge underlying world that we don't really see as usual cyberspace Travelers, users, uh, people who live within this space uh, is this underlying piece of the dark web and many of the illegal activities that go on there. I will say that there are some positive pieces of uh, the dark web, however, and the deep web in that there are some countries in which uh, uh, free speech is, uh, is held back and some people within organizations for women's rights, women's rights, human rights, et cetera, are able to use the dark web to bypass uh, some of the suppression of free speech within those countries. Um, so it does have some good uses. I don't want anyone to come out of this thinking that the deep web and dark web are only nefarious and, and evil and bad because they are. They have some actual uh, really good uses. Um, in fact, uh, Tor, which is the browser, main browser for the dark web and deep web, was developed by the United States Navy uh, back in the day, and now is being used across the world as uh, this this uh, the onion router, this many layered, uh, very secure way of browsing the deep web and dark dark web, and can be used for good in many cases. So, wanted to make sure that I put that out there. So what about viruses and other malicious and lost code and all of these other sort of microorganism things that live out there? Uh, poison systems are distinct from systems infected with computer viruses, which allow malicious code to transfer to other systems when it meets various conditions through a self-replicating mechanism. Self Keep that in mind, self-replicating mechanism. We're going to talk a bit about, more about that in a moment. Uh, that's from Stevens and Biller, 2018. The recent COVID-19 pandemic led Admiral James Fago, head of U.S. Naval Forces in Europe and Africa, to state, I'm opining now about a seventh domain, with the sixth domain being logistics, and that seventh domain is just simply germs. It's the biosphere that we operate in, and I think we're going to have to take that into account in our preparations for deterrence and defense in the future, and that was just published this year in 2020. Consider how this concept of the biosphere as a domain of warfare correlates to the concept of the cyber microbiome. Uh, it has many co corollaries. We should probably expect cyber pandemics riding on a wave of massive parasitic code within the cyber microbiosphere, which has been characterized as the Internet of Things. Um, and I discussed a little bit about, you know, talking about the Internet of Things in the past the last presentation, but uh, the Internet of Things is uh, really very much like this microbiosphere uh, that J Admiral Fago is is talking about. Uh, it's a huge uh, area. It has a huge attack surface. Uh, there are many possibilities for infection that can occur within the Internet of Things, and it's something that correlates very well with the whole concept of the biosphere as an attack surface in the physical world. So there's some definite corollaries there as well. All right, the next area is uh, living archives. And this one I found to be fascinating. Uh, a lot of people call this, uh, it's just, um, in many cases, you know, you just think of it as ar archive data. But really, these archives uh, have this sort of living attribute to them in that uh, people call them the file life. They, they actually contain the memories. Uh, the actions, in, in some cases, as we'll see here in a moment, um, some of the most intimate details of people's lives. Confluence of carbon and silicon-based information hybridization can be seen in the experimentation taking place in the life of Finnish artist, engineer, and composer Erki Kiranimi. 
A Belgian art and media group named Constant foregrounds the digital life of an archive by practicing what it calls an archive, active archive. Unlike most online archive initiatives, Constant places emphasis on the generative and active part of making an archive come alive. Uh, and that's from Rossack uh, 2017. Current Emmy, uh, this artist and engineer, actually allowed Constant to film and record everything, everything he did, hoping to use the information to resurrect himself in the future. Now, as strange as that may sound, it's interesting. Just consider all of the information that exists out there about Erki Karanimi right now. You can go to their website. I have a picture of it up here uh, on the slide, uh, and actually go and and go through his archive and look at. At, at pictures and, and stories and film and all of these things of everything from this man's life. And I mean, he allowed them to, to film things like him going to the bathroom and having sexual intercourse and sleeping and, you know, everything that he did. But, and for, for his reasons, you know, of hoping to resurrect himself in the future. Now, whether or not he'll be able to do that, the fascination uh, <laughs> exists and the data itself exists. Uh, and the fact of, of those two things uh, together uh, really extend themselves into the concept of the cyber microbiome just because that um, that vast amount of information about just one person exists out there and we can access it. Uh, most people don't know about it, but you know now you do. So go check it out. It's really interesting. Uh, another area uh, that I wanted to kind of let you look into this uh, in is uh, this video and I'll have to for my colleagues to hear I'm going to unplug and then play the video and then I'll plug back in to continue the conversation. So I can get it to play. Can't seem to. Okay. Hopefully my uh, audio is back through my uh, headset now. <laughs> I'm going to continue talking and hope that that's true. Uh, so that was that very uh, poignant video was actually, uh, I think, the 2019 Super Bowl commercial uh, and uh, the Google Super Bowl commercial. And it's wonderful i love that concept of being able to keep these memories of someone you love and to uh re remember them and help other people to remember them i think it's great i have nothing against it whatsoever or what i i just found that it was very interesting because it goes along very well with the concept of living archives because this is 
we're we're doing this now. We're 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 extending our loved ones, you know, into the future in some way uh, through remembrance, uh, which I think is great. Um, it, but this data, you know, where does it go? Where does it where is it held? Who can access it? Um, how long will it stay where it is? Uh, these are all questions that are just arising out of these these uh, types of technologies that allow us to hold on to our dear loved ones and to remember them. Um, in, in into the future. Uh, this is my uncle Ladon. This is his uh, Facebook page, and I love my uncle Ladon. Uh, he is here in a picture with his his father, whose uh, name was Ladon, uh, his son, whose name was Ladon, and his uh, grandchild, whose name was also Ladon. Is four. Well, there were all four Joseph, and then had a middle name of of uh, of Ladon. But the four Joes, I think. Uh, here all together. And uh, everybody every year goes on to my uncle's Facebook page and they wish him happy birthday and they tell him much, how much they love him and everything else. And that would not be so strange if my uncle had not passed away six years ago. Uh, but again, this is his Facebook page and we still honor him. We still you know, visit him. We still keep his memory alive uh, through this type of living archive, this type of active archive that continues his memory now and into the future. So these are just some examples of, of the surface web type living archives that we see. But again, this information, you know, how long will it be stored? How long will it go on? Uh, how much of information like this is actually uh, living out there on uh, in, in, in cyberspace, in the cyber meta reality? It, it, these are all questions that I don't have firm answers to, but things that are in consideration for uh, the cyber meta reality and microbiome. All right, so now we move on to symbiotic code and applications or code that writes code, also called meta programming. Uh, life is defined as something that consumes, and this is a scientific definition of life, something that consumes, grows, and can reproduce without destroying itself in the process. Uh, based on this simple definition, things like fire and viruses existing within our physical space are not considered to be alive since neither can reproduce without effectively destroying themselves. It can be said that a computer can be both reliable but not infallible and yet perform functions without the authority or knowledge of the owner or software writer. This may be the code it happens to execute in a way because of a strange or unforeseen conjunction of inputs, which neither the owner nor the writer had imagined. That's from Mason, 2017. So why is this important? Well, as scientists and medical professionals recognize, the human microbiome has fundamentally changed how they do research and practice medicine. Likewise, the concept of the cyber microbiome will inevitably affect the way we operate in the cyber meta reality. If we don't have a good understanding of what actually comprises this underlying world of the cyber uh, meta reality, this piece called the cyber microbiome specifically, we may not be able to as easily diagnose issues, for instance, that are occurring within cyberspace because we don't understand the full scope of what's happening from this microbiotic uh, direction. So how do we apply this concept of the cyber meta reality and microbiome to the cyber multiverse we live in and experience? There are many ways, but we'll focus on three areas of interest. Um, first off, threat intelligence, and then we'll look at uh, diagnostic and predictive uh, pieces that, as well. So first off, uh, the, 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 the to threat intelligence. As we discuss cyber threat intelligence, I want to point out how threats are created, proliferated, mutated, and sustained through various aspects of the cyber meta reality and microbiome. If we can gain insight through these information environments, it will be easier to explain how threat intelligence can be collected, analyzed, and disseminated. If you look at the intelligence process to the right, it is immediately clear that intelligence is all about knowing what you are doing and consistently evaluating and providing feedback regarding the information at your disposal. This is exactly what a threat analyst must do when analyzing the cyber meta reality and microbiome. Through understanding these parts of the information environment, 
threat analysts can begin to characterize, categorize, plan, and forecast threat instantiations, growth, change, and foothold in order to better counter, mitigate, and neutralize nascent and existing cyber threats. Just as physicians use the, the human microbiome as a diagnostic source, the cyber microbiome can be used to diagnose issues stemming from various sources. So for instance, on the dark web, where is the problem spreading from? What is the source? Who is responsible? Uh, you know, just considering right now, you know, all the contact tracing we're doing with, with COVID-19, all of those uh, things that, that go into that. Or think about cyber viruses, microorganisms, parasites. What kind of disease is it? How can it be cured? Um, you know, and this is, again, from the cyber perspective. These are things that we should be able to use as diagnostic devices from a cyber microbiotic uh, standpoint. Living archives, is there information extant in the meta-reality that could be useful or could it be causing a problem? Diagnostic uh, po possibility uh, or code that writes code, is the problem spreading and how can it be stopped? Um, you know, with code that writes other code, if it's something that continues to, to reproduce and proliferate and grow, how can we stem that? How can we go and actually stop that spread uh, and reproduction? Uh, do we want to stop it? Is it a good thing? Do we want to actually encourage it? These are all questions that can come out of a diagnostic use of the cyber microbiome. Cyber, uh, cyber DNA and junk DNA. Is the problem inherent at the cyber genetic level, at the code level, or at the reproductive level? Is it an issue in the connected information within the system itself? So again, diagnostic capabilities of this particular uh, uh, application of the cyber microbiome. Many of the issues faced in the cyber meta reality are due to poor signal production and attribution. Predictive solutions could be derived from the cyber microbiome. So. For instance, in the dark web, building data sites and actors and groups, uh, you know, all of these different pieces for establishing signatures. Um, actually, in another talk that I gave, uh, the one that I did for the panel, I talk about uh, using uh, already established methodologies that are existent in uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance and electromagnetic warfare to build databases and tools to use for developing signature, uh, establishing signatures for cyber attacks uh, from a threat intelligence perspective. And then those for attribution and targeting within cyberspace. And the dark, this is one of the ways that it could be that these types of uh, pieces could be built. And that's a, 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 an important piece uh, of this as well, we have to re recognize that if we just go in and we're to say, for instance, totally obliterate the dark web, the deep web, uh, not only does that remove some positive things, but it also takes away our capability to be able to trace uh, uh, malevolent actors because so much of what crime, where crime is committed and, and, and acted and organized is in these dark and deep web spaces today. So being able to have this place where we can actually gather threat intelligence from and build these databases for targeting attribution is actually very, very important and a, a great uh, piece of, of using the cyber microbiome. Uh, cyber viruses, microorgan uh, microorganisms, and parasites, uh, you can identify advanced, advanced persistent threats uh, through, through, the, uh, through studying these, common toolkits and cyber diseases uh, or, or, you know, uh, the different... Uh, pieces of, of, of cyber attacks that can be enacted through here uh, in, in this study of the cyber microbiome. In living archives, you can capture archive information to build profile data and leverage historical information. Again, building databases, putting information together for uh, threat intelligence and other uses. In code that writes code, using code resources and strategies to track where the code began and how to uh, mitigate the issues. Again, sort of like cyber contact tracing. You're trying to track back uh, to its origin where the code originated or was initially instantiated and be able to do something about it at the source rather than just trying to, you know, kill something here, kill something there, stop something here, stop something there. You mitigate it at the source through the tracing. And, so, and for cyber DNA and junk DNA, identify issues at the lowest genetic 
level or root information and potential solution and therapies that can be used to actually mitigate the problems that are being exacerbated through the use of this sort of cyber DNA throughout a system and throughout the cyber meta reality. As practitioners, we must remember that not all information within the cyber microbiome is bad or harmful. And I mentioned some of this earlier. Just as our human microbiome is useful and vital to our bodily function, so is the cyber microbiome to the cyber meta reality. The dark web provides a realm in which to test, explore, and conduct secure operations. You know, you consider that Tor was originally a, a U.S. Navy project that I mentioned just a little while ago. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's really a, a good thing that it is there. It's something we can use to our advantage. Uh, we don't want to constantly look at it as something just merely negative, although there are a lot of negative things on the dark web. Uh, there are also many positive aspects of it, especially uh, if we're going to be able to use it as practitioners to actually go somewhere uh, with, uh, with di diagnostic uh, resources um, and things of that sort. Uh, also, cyber viruses, microorganisms, uh, parasites. Some parasitic, parasitic data is absolutely necessary to cyber meta reality functionality and growth. So things like patches, open source code, um, all of the things that you know are floating around out there that are very useful to actual cyber health, so to speak, um, and uh, uh, cyber uh, uh, growth and cyber perpetuation. Those are all pieces, just like in our human bodies. You know, we have bacteria, gut flora, that if they didn't exist, um, we'd have constant diarrhea or constipation or, you know, many other things. You really have to have uh, many of the symbiotic organisms that live within us and on our skin and everywhere around us. They have to exist for us to live or else we'll be, uh, you know, faced with many horrible maladies. Cyberspace is the same way. The cyber meta reality is the same way without some of these uh, – these parasites and microorganisms, so to speak, from a cyber perspective, uh, the health and welfare of the cyber meta reality is uh, in question. Living archives. Archive info can be useful in many ways diagnostically and for predictive analysis. Also valuable to loved ones for per perpetuating a type of file life. So remember, keeping memories of your loved ones. That's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. There are positives to that. Also, code that writes code. Uh, it's growing in purpose and scope. This is already a possible life form worthy of study due to its ability to grow, consume, and reproduce without destroying itself. So actually having um, these uh, capabilities in place with code that can perpetuate itself, it can be a good thing in, in many ways. Uh, it can do a lot of automatic things that we haven't considered yet, um, some that we have as far as the ability to analyze data, learn, uh, progress, evolve, so to speak, uh, as it works its way through the cyber meta reality. Also, cyber DNA and cyber junk, junk DNA is very useful in understanding the basic fundamental matter of the cyber meta reality and microbiome. If we can get down to that basic DNA code level of understanding those pieces, um, oh, now I'm finally on the thing. Um, <laughs> then we can uh, have a better understanding of the cyber meta reality uh, and microbiome. But understanding the cyber meta reality and microbiome can help practitioners pinpoint areas of weakness and understand the cyber multiverse better uh, as a result of understanding all of these different component pieces of it. Ultimately, we must uh, uh, continue to explore the ramifications of this new world with its life, multiple realities, and growing influence. And um, that basically ends my, uh, my presentation. Um, just a couple of notes. Uh, I will say that uh, the cyber meta reality and cyber microbiome track well with threat genomics. Uh, Espen Scheid and Gunn in 2012 uh, talk a lot about threat genomics uh, and mo models the detectable changes attackers introduce into an operational system. It also aligns well with the Broad Street technology uh, taxonomy as uh, purported by Shostak in 2014, a methodology for attack categorization akin to how Linnaeus used the tree of life to categorize vertebrates, invertebrates, and all of the subclassifications of animals, protozoa, and other organisms. So uh, these, you know, pieces of this concept of the cyber and microbiome track well with other areas of, of science and, and technology, and I think have some great uh, 
uh, applicability for uh, use in, in, in diagnostics and in, uh, tracking and tracing in uh, uh, threat intelligence and in, in many other areas as, as we move forward. So that ends my presentation and I'm going to open it up to these gentlemen for any comments or questions and thank you so much for your attention. Oh. Right. And the techniques to do this can be a uh, range from relatively simple to uh, extremely uh, sophisticated and, uh, and tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think it operates at several different levels. So there's the level of what they did with uh, Erki Karanimi, uh, where it's just vast amounts of data that's being recorded constantly, right, and built into this huge database that's stored for, you know, purposely for access by other people. Uh, that's one end of the spectrum, so to speak. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, which seems to be a bit more informal, like the Google way of doing it, where it's like, okay, or the Facebook way of doing it, where it's okay, I have this information that I want to keep and store and keep at my, uh, t at my disposal for retrieval uh, in very simple ways. Just some photos here, maybe a video, maybe just some words of encouragement or, or some words of remembrance about this loved one. So it's sort of this... There's that small end of the spectrum, then the large end of the spectrum. Both of them accessible, uh, at least at least those those types of pieces. I think where we kind of miss is the stuff in the middle, right? So the things uh, that I've taken personally and stored in the cloud, so to speak, somewhere, and maybe only I and a few of my family members have access to that. Well, it's stored there. It's stored there for... I don't know if it's a free service. It could be stored there for virtually, quote unquote, forever. Um, what kind of amount of space is mine and everyone else's data taking up? I don't know. These are statistics, I think, that are going to be important for people to find over time. But I will say in, in, in some of the research that I did uh, about archives in general, uh, archivists are having a heyday with this, you know. Because archivists in the past, they just been looked at, you know, sort of humdrum. Yeah, they just keep information stored in a library somewhere. Not so anymore. Uh, arch archivists are uh, the the field of of archiving information has grown exponentially over the last few decades as a result of so much information being stored in the cyber meta reality, right? in this space where there's so many realities and so many pieces of information coming together and they're having to uh, find different ways to express information. They're having to find different ways of, of how to uh, understand it from a, an objective point of view because of the different sometimes uh, contradictory pieces of information that are going into these archives. Um, it's very complex, extremely complex, not just, from the amount of information, but the way the information is being reported. And then you have to consider, okay, well, what, what's the truth and what should be accessed and, you know, how do we sort of filter this through the historical viewpoint uh, from this point forward? Uh, it's, it's extraordinarily complex, uh, far more than I could <laughs> attempt to describe here today um but you did that kind of help with answer the question a little bit i hope yes Mm -hmm. The underlying information, but uh, with words uh, and mm -hmm. more advanced techniques, it's uh, still hard to find uh, the right information. 
Mm -hmm. And you might not even know whether it's that or uh, on the other end, you get a lot of, let's say, outside uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. And the second step is once you've selected a couple of uh, items, as in the, the video, how to pose uh, a story out of this. This is quite a different job. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really great point, uh, Helmut, because. Yeah, if you consider it like so, I mean, the, there's some really great search, as you know, algorithms in existence. But then, like, how do you apply that to certain uh, uh, esoteric data sets, right? Because that's what you get into when you're dealing with personal archived information. It's not like the more broad, big data that we see out for everyone. It's very, it's very uh small you know it's it could be a lot of data but it could be a like a like i said esoteric it'd be very uh narrow field of view so yeah what how do you work with that kind of data it's a whole different way of, of thinking about that data and searching through it and uh building it you know uh, reassembling it into something coherent and meaningful so yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Hmm. I guess it also depends how archiving is possible. So mm -hmm. if you have a case of where you decided to do something more structured, where you have a specific plan to your flow, then certainly it counts. Mm -hmm. If, for example, you have just images and videos without uh, nothing, so <laughs> well, right right it's it's just so many layers of uh complexity in that whole process yeah. just that piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and so much of it, I think, is, is going to, you know, it, it has to be based on metadata, right? Yeah. So it's the, having good metadata to follow the, for that process to work better. Um, I, I, now, I could see in the future, uh, you know, some of the potential, uh, maybe it, it, with through some learning algorithms for heuristics, et cetera, that might be able to help fill in some of the blanks on metadata. Uh, but starting with good metadata is is the key, I'm sure, you know, to a lot of it. So, I mean, yeah. that's that's actually something else I've brought up. I've had I've discussed before in the pa in the past is uh facebook is just one example like twitter is another uh instagram you know these se several different uh places where people have uh the information stored for their deceased loved ones and there are a couple of different ways to think about it because for instance i was recently uh just within the last few months uh my parents uh had me sign forms to become their will and also to be uh their uh, power of attorney for, for both of them in the instance that they're coming to the end of their life and they can't make decisions. And so I'll make the legal decisions for their good, right? So these legal stipulations and preparations uh, are starting to be made for things like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and other, other social media because uh, people will die and nobody knows what their passwords are. Or and and they and their their will stipulates that they want their social media to be wiped away. Some people don't. Some people, when they pass away, they would love for their social media to continue their their living archive to continue as a memory uh, of them. So these are becoming legal uh, stipulations that are covered in a person's uh, last will and testament and in other legal, you know, by by their legal means. Um, but 
as far as uh, most social media sources are concerned, that as I understand it from my research, they uh, are completely okay with you keeping a memory page indefinitely for your loved ones. Um, they they have no uh, legal uh, recourse against it. Um, problem with it, insofar as it does not go outside the bounds of their acceptable use policies, right? So they have acceptable use policies that you agree to. Um, you know, you don't post, you know, pornography or post, um, uh, you know, a terrorist activity or criminal activity, any of those kinds of things. So as long as you're not doing anything like that, they're not going to say you, you know, you, you have to remove it, essentially. For uh, for the archive part or for everything, for every no um so it it goes into uh, I get into uh, that I did research on databases so where informa where the information is stored uh, in clouds you know uh, different cloud uh, areas uh, data banks and things like that um, some of the areas like that where data is stored um, also research into uh, uh, Trying to think. Oh, the co the coding resources like the actual uh, meta programming uh, instantiations and and where they're moving. There's a there's a uh, Bayou is a system that does that right now. It's uh, uh, it, it was created in uh, university in the U.S. I'm trying to remember the name of the university. I can't remember it right now, but they have an actual. There's several. Bayou is just one. Uh, particular type where they have written code that writes other code, can assemble other code and actually reproduce, uh, and that code can reproduce and that code can reproduce. <laughs> it's fascinating, um, but that's the kind of you know code growth that we're beginning to see. And uh, you know if that if that catches if that continues to proliferate, um, it can it can go in really great directions, but it can also go in some bad directions depending on if you're using it in a manner of like a Stuxnet worm. Versus if you're trying to use it more in a, in a way to uh, maybe do some uh, content tracing uh, or, or, you know, uh, uh, trying to keep up with information over large data sets and using that for uh, uh, deep learning and uh, machine learning and some things like that. But uh, a lot of different directions you can go with it. But yeah, it was lots of different levels that I tried to look at because every level of the cyber uh, microbiome within the cyber meta reality had a very specific kind of niche that it filled and so i had to go and look in a lot of different places and a lot of different directions to kind of draw the threads together to tie them all together into something coherent that made sense uh sort of build this narrative this meta narrative for it all I think that it it has the potential to to do that, yes. But um, based off of, um, like I said, another paper that I wrote uh, that should be uh, that will be published in uh, the Journal of Information Warfare uh, next year. Uh, it's about using the techniques uh, and procedures of uh, that have been used for years in intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance that I've used myself before and electromagnetic warfare the databases and tools and uh, and management information management suites that uh, allow for the database building and signature building um, to be able to trace down particular targets and to keep track of those and to do attribution and targeting on those particular targets in those disciplines but using this, those same techniques to build the same kinds of databases and heuristics and and function functionality to do the, to do the same kind of databasing and tracing and targeting and uh, attribution just in cyber uh, the cyber meta reality versus um, you know the the other the, the other places the other disciplines. Interface learning, interpose the source of, for example, the interpreter. 
Barca, the, the one that was mm -hmm. it maybe the case of the war that was depending on the uh, the past that they had. But this is uh, was more or less abstraction of the of data and fleshing it out mm -hmm. incrementally until you come to the uh, down to the, the real job and it uh, so such a design uh, aims at making abstractions mm -hmm. uh, and avoiding with, uh, redundancies and good conception and, uh, uh, and so on. It's rare that you have more than one or maybe uh, maybe two elements. Mm -hmm. But I guess what you meant is more on the level of uh, replication for the purpose of replication. Mm -hmm. So which, uh, let's say, distribute the same version, the same kind of thing. So simpler in, the, uh, in effect, uh, and uh, has basically the, the purpose of disturbance of some sort. Mm -hmm. So make the, in the simplest uh, case, uh, make the storage full at, uh, at some point, mm -hmm. or doing some other things, uh, let's say doing some power that might uh, help in that kind of sense. Right, and that's the parallel process uh, of, of the reproduction is the positive side that I'm referring to, but there's also the negative reproduction side, like, you know, with, again, I, I used the example of Stuxnet because it's, you know, everybody knows about it. And it was a worm that reproduced through systems in a, in a bad way, at least, you know, from the Iranian perspective uh, to, to, to do the, the bad job that it did on their, uh, their uh, centrifuges. Uh, and also, you know, once it again got into the wild, it went everywhere. It just replicated it everywhere, but it didn't do anything because it was so specifically programmed to look for only the the Siemens devices that it was corrupting and uh, causing the centrifuges to spin too fast and just and break down. So. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's trying to call home yeah. over and over again. So yeah, it's it's crazy. But so yeah, so there's uh, wow. It's again a lot of complexity there. A lot of open room for research and study in all those levels uh, uh, of the concept. Um, but there you are. So. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, I'll, I'll go ahead and. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, help. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, the space without, uh, so in a place where target is not found. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is more difficult uh, is, uh, as an example, I said, so when you look for many movers in parallel, several bosses is dying for some reason, you want to set in more, but you want to keep the population at the reasonable size. So you do want to shrink it uh, up to a, a point where it doesn't help you much. But on the other hand, you don't want to expand it uh, in a way that it drops storage or so. Right. That's, that's trickier because it's in the multi-agent system. Everyone knows, every agent knows, okay, I'm here, I'm doing this and this. But who is the overview of how the whole system is? So you can check, okay, how much space uh, CPU time or so is there. And that could be an indication. So stopping reproduction at, uh, at some moment. Uh, but all these systems don't have, so it's uh, unlimited reproduction mm -hmm. in a sense. So, right. Uh, in, these, uh, in these systems, uh, you cannot somehow as, uh, assess, uh, well, there is no limitation of it, but speed and uh, let's say growth rate or so. Mm -hmm. Or is this well, just from the observing the effect in the system? Yeah. Well, and I think some of what you're talking brings me back to thinking about uh, the difference between the way Stuxnet was designed and Configure for for 
for example, because configure it was working its way. It, it, it there was no limit to the amount of reproduction and damage that it would do because the people who programmed it didn't care. They just wanted to cause. They didn't care the, the amount of chaos that it caused, right? But with Stuxnet, whoever programmed it decided that they only wanted to target it towards certain things, and if it didn't find those things, it would lie dormant in a system. So they minimized damage through the, repro the programming of the worm to not reproduce into or to cause damage, I should say, in systems into which it reproduced. So, so much of it comes down to, I think, the values of the, of the person who builds the programming in the first place. And then, you know, that really uh, sort of sets in motion how it's going to act and react with it within its information environment as it as it works its way through systems, right? So, yeah, that's a big part of it is where the the, the origination point of, of it all. That's right. That's right to hide itself. Yes, to be very very stealthy. So that that's again, yeah, another difference because I don't think Configure was like that at all. It was everybody is just pfft, like you know just vomited out everywhere. So uh, right. It needed to lie dormant for a period of time, yeah, yeah. sort of like a right, <laughs> exactly. So they wouldn't get caught because they plugged that thumb drive into the system somewhere. They had to protect the human element, absolutely, uh, which is a whole other level of that whole discussion. So, but yeah, that's fascinating. It is. It's fascinating. So, oh yeah, absolutely. Is still being studied, you know. I mean, was it 2007 it was discovered or something? I think, or okay, yep, it was earlier than that. Yeah, okay, so yeah, wow, just it's amazing. Great, well, uh, well, thank you again so much for your uh significant comments and questions i really appreciate it and thank you to everyone else at the era conference um so pleased you could be with us uh uh virtually in nice uh even if not able to be here in person um but uh we really appreciate your participation in the conference and hope that you enjoy this and our other talks that we'll be having this week i'm looking forward to hearing from these gentlemen as well so hope you can join us for some of those and thank you so much uh for your attentiveness today. Uh, bonjour.